The Train to the Past, Part 6, written and read for you by Emily Z. Prologue, Max. Let's go, Mom! Max called over his shoulder. He'd been planning this moment, right from when Laura, his older sister, erased his parents' memories. It was perfect when they'd received a call from his grandmother, asking his family if they would like to come visit. In Florida. That was where a train wreck was. That was where Laura was. And William. William. How do I know that name? It was also where he had to go in order to prove the trains of the past was real. Memories and thoughts had come rushing into his head a few days ago. The trains of the past. Jack. The conductor. A different Laura. A glowing door. A winding staircase. A glowing blue rose pendant and so much more. Danger. Fear. Anger. Confusion. Grief. Regret. But also happiness and joy. Laughter and smiles. All these thoughts and memories had to have come from somewhere. Whatever. Max shoved his suitcase into the trunk of the car, hopping into the back seat. Usually he'd fight for shotgun with his sister, but this time, with only three people in the car and his parents sitting in the front, he'd get the back seat completely to himself. Time to get proof, Lara. Mom and Dad, just you wait. The trains to the past. I cough and hack and wheeze, my body doing whatever it can to get the purple smoke out of my lungs. I hear a similar sound coming from my right, and when I see William already standing up, I struggle to my feet, only to collapse again. I fall onto my hands and knees, a motion making my stomach feel like it just got off the world's biggest roller coaster, and I must sit down again and take deep breaths in order to stop myself from vomiting all over the floor. Or what's left of it, at least. Why am I sleeping in somewhere that looks like a house that got blasted apart? And who's William? Every memory I have is hazy, like they were plucked out of my mind one by one. Laura, the boy says, moving to my side. I scoot away, fighting back the blast of nausea. I'm sorry, but who are you? I ask. How do you know my name? Laura, it's me. William. William, William, William. Why does that name sound so familiar and so weird at the same time? I sigh and stand up, leaning against the wall for support. I really don't know who you are, I explain. I feel like I know you, but also don't know you at the same time. Two people behind me gasp at the same time, and I spin around to face them. And who are you? Is it Halloween? Is that why you're wearing a train conductor's uniform? The boy's eyes widen, and he starts to walk slowly around me. Is this how a fish feels when it's about to get eaten by a shark? Laura, he says again slowly. Do you remember being with a 14-year-old boy of blonde hair named William? Er, no, I reply. Should I? He sucks in a breath. And no nine-year-old girl named Laura either? Red hair, pale skin? No, I say. Why is her name Laura too? And you don't remember a man about as old as your grandfather wearing a navy blue uniform? The boy continues questioning. No, I exclaim. Why are you asking me stuff like this? You're making it sound like I used to know them. Oh, are they that grandfather aged man and red-haired Laura you were talking about? Then you must be William. Nice to meet you. I stick out my hand for him to shake, but he doesn't take it. Instead, he says, Excuse us for a minute, Laura. Grandfather and I need to talk. What about me? The other Laura protests. Stay with Laura and introduce yourself. We'll be back soon. William orders, and they turn around, leaving me here. When William and the old guy are done talking, William turns to me and takes a deep breath. Laura, please don't freak out. But I think your memories were erased. I'm standing on the top of a very tall hill. The wind is blowing through my hair, and with the forest behind me and nothing below the hill except grass and flowers, I feel like I'm on top of the world. Too bad William is tugging impatiently on my sleeve and saying my name a million times. Are you sure we should be doing this? I ask again as William pushes me toward the old man and the girl and... A white van. A familiar white van. Too familiar. With a few patches of dirt near the wheels, a smiley face sticker in the back window, and... Just when I think my luck can't get any worse... There's my family. Dad, Mom, and... Ugh, Max. Why are you guys here? I whine. Why didn't you guys erase our memories, run away together, hide from us, tell lies, sneak them into your room, and keep this a secret? 
Max snarks back, copying my voice. Clara? My dad says, shooting me a, how could you do this? Look like I'm a kid who's broken an antique vase. William! Max yelps, running forward. He pauses midstep with a confused look on his face. How do I know you? He wonders. Sam's eyes widen. Whoa. He breathes, turning to the old guy who's currently in a glare-down contest with my dad. Did what I think just happened actually happen? William asks. What just happened? I wonder aloud. I think. William replies, avoiding my parents' looks, but being loud enough to be heard. That Max got your memories. Oh no, I groan. Why him? Why me? Max protests at the same time. Getting my memories erased is bad enough, but why does Max have to have them now? Well, William reassures our gadget doesn't erase memories completely. It only hides them from you. So in order to make yourself re-remember them, you just need to see something that'll trigger them. See? Max glows, shoving his way forward to face William. He said our invention, not the invention. He's living proof that Lara's working with them, and that they've erased our memories. Well, your memories, anyway. We've tried everything, I almost yell on the verge of tears. Why are my memories coming back? So far, I've tried staring at the glowing pile of blue rose pendants until my eyes started hurting, sorting through all of William's blueprints, although I suspect he made me do that on purpose, folding an origami box, blowing up a balloon, looking at the pile of rubble, which turned out to be a train wreck, dancing a ballet solo, and hearing William, the old guy, the conductor, and the girl Laura, why did she have my name, tell stories. Nothing has worked. Nothing. At all. Well, uh... William starts, then trails off. I guess there might be one more thing we haven't tried. Maybe. A very important thing. All eyes focus on him, and the arguing, talking, and ideas come to a stop. William sighs. Do you remember the first thing Lars saw that connects to this, Grandpa? Yes. Well, ever since that memory clicked into place, it's been a really important one to Lara. So, if something can bring her memories back, this will be it. I think... What? I ask. The conductor freezes mid-step. No. He whispers. You think you're actually capable of doing that? William nods, swallowing hard. I think it's time to rebuild the train to the past. Epilogue. Conductor. William can't, but he doesn't mean. That's impossible. The suggestion shocked the conductor so much that he backed up a few steps, taking deep breaths. His grandson. His little boy, Willie, had just confirmed that he was planning to rebuild the train. All these years, 15 years, the conductor had been torn between choosing William or Jack to inherit the train. Basic contest rules apply. Knowledge, brains, passion, whoever was better than the other would control the train. He vaguely remembered saying, Someday, grandson, he'll run the train to the past. To William, but of course he hadn't expected it to happen so soon. Besides, Jack wasn't completely out of the running yet. For William and Jack, life had been a never-ending contest. To see who was better, smarter, pleased their parents more, looked more handsome, won a race, and much more. But ever since Jack had gone to the mirror portal thing, which was highly forbidden, and lost a piece of himself, he hadn't come back. He just ran. Away from friends. Away from family. Away from his glorious future. Maybe he'd known that people would think of him as weird, based on his new look. Or maybe he didn't want to show his face to anyone, afraid of how they'd react. Or maybe the stories of the broken pieces had scared him into hiding. Or maybe he'd wanted to punish himself, although that was unlikely. Jack knew exactly what he was doing, and usually never did anything wrong. Ever. But there was another rule in place. One that was often overlooked, but... The words of the handbook echoed back into the conductor's mind. One sentence. Whoever contributes the most to the train to the past willingly, and not knowing this rule, shall be handed the responsibility of conductor. And here, William was planning to rebuild the entire train to help his friend, but with no idea that such a rule existed. And surely rebuilding the train after an explosion was the biggest deed anyone had ever done. But maybe... Maybe the conductor wasn't ready to give up his role yet. Maybe he still wants a few days of being called conductor. Maybe the train had become his home. Maybe he still wanted a jewel-encrusted pin to shine from his uniform. And maybe he loved it too much to hand it over to someone else's hands, even his grandson's. 
Maybe I still have a few more days. The conductor thought as William started handing out instructions. She doesn't finish a deed until the train is fixed. But then, the train will be yours, grandson. Good luck. The End Thank you for listening. I hope you have enjoyed The Trains of the Past Part 6. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and share this video with family and friends. Links to the rest of the story are in the description section below. Part 7, coming soon.